passage of scripture we're going to be walking through uh, this morning is found in the book of Mark, chapter 10. And our text this morning is Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me there. Mark 10, 17 to 31 is our text, and we'll have it up on the overhead as well. And this passage deals with an issue that really, I, I think, is, it's a very serious issue to, to tackle. And this issue keeps many, many, many people out of the kingdom of God. And it's good for us to reflect and to restore as we pick up on the story that Jesus tells. So Jesus had just finished talking to, to the disciples about how we need to be childlike in our faith towards God. And last week I talked about how it's important for us to, to grow up in our salvation and be mature in our, in our uh, pursuit of God, but also to have that childlike quality, the childlike faith. And so picking up on that, um, the disciples start to move along, and um, it says in verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we see this man, he's enthusiastic. He, he runs up to Jesus and shows him uh, some, some respect, right? He, he, come, he falls on his knees before the Lord, and he calls him good teacher. Now, in, in parallel passages in the New Testament for this story, in, in the book of Matthew, um, uh, the, this man is, is described as being a young man. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that um, this man had some power. He, he was a ruler. And, and here in Mark, we see that this man was, is wealthy as well. So um, the man who approached Jesus in the text this morning, he was wealthy, young, and he had influence. He had power. Now, from a purely surface level analysis, like if you think about that, many people that think this is the ultimate gifting in life. Um, if a person can have uh, influence, great influence, uh, wealth, and in the midst of that, have their youth to be able to um, navigate through life in a, in a, in a robust way, wow, that's, that's great. Um, by this world standards, this particular fellow that came to Jesus, he had a lot going for him. So he, he came to Jesus and he, and he fell on his knees before the Lord. And in his mind, this man had everything one could ever want or, or ask for in this world. He was a keenly religious man, and he had uh, been following um, the law of Moses. But there was this nagging uncertainty that was in him about his future. It was kind of part of the package that wasn't there. It's funny. You know, you can pursue all kinds of things in this life. You can have wealth, you can have your youth, and you can have prestige. You can be popular or famous. But the things in this life can never truly satisfy a person. There's always something missing. No matter how good things to be, be on the surface level, this man was lacking assurance in, in what was going to happen to him after he passed away. Everybody you know, some people push, push it out of their mind and they, they say, I'm just going not going to think about that and I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. But, you know, when you're alone at nighttime or when you're out in, in different places and, and you see other people pass away or tragedy uh, strike, people are left with this uncertainty. What's going to happen to me after I die. Now, some say that's just, you're, that's it. There's no hope. So if, if you don't have this sparkling existence here and now, well, you're, you're missing everything. But, you know, there's other people that go, you know, like, I've suffered in my life. You know, I, I want to know what's going to happen. Is there any, is there any life after death? And, and if there is life after death and there is heaven, how do I get there? People ask this. And, and we've, we ask this question too. That's why we're here this morning, because we've come to some conclusions about this, or we're searching. 
So Jesus had been teaching, and, and he'd been doing miracles, and at least on the part that he was observable to this young man, he was good. He was doing good things. And um, he'd likely just seen Jesus taking the little children up into his arms and, and blessing him, because this is right on the tail of that, right? The love that exuded from the life of Jesus had been something that this young man recognized, possibly that his riches, his youth, and his, and his morality and his, and his influence that, that they'd not brought to him. Perhaps in all honesty, he believed that Jesus had something new. He, he had something sure that, that he didn't have in his set of uh, accomplishments or, or um, attainments. And um, so, so he approached the Lord and, uh, and he said, uh, good teacher. He fell down before him and said, good teacher. 18, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. See, God saw into this young man's heart. He was moral. He lived a clean and decent life according to the Ten Commandments. There was much potential for this young man to become one of Jesus' disciples. He, yeah, his heart, in his heart, he wanted to do good things. There was no reason to believe that this young man was lying about his commitment to doing what was right. Jesus didn't uh, uh, challenge him on those points. But there was something inside of this young man that was missing. Jesus loved him as he looked at him. He loved him too much not to tell him the truth. You see, this young man believed something that we often see people believing about themselves which isn't really true. And this young man believed at the base level that he was essentially a genuinely good person. At the surface level, he looked at his life and he was doing good. And he was correct. He was doing pretty good. Now, he wasn't like people that were constantly breaking the Ten Commandments. He hadn't broken any of them since he was a boy. This is what he says. But Jesus sees his heart at a deeper level than, than, than he can even see about himself. And, and you know, God, when he looks at us, he can see the deepest part of us that nobody else sees. For although we might live a good, moral, and decent life, the truth is that living a good, moral, decent life is not enough to earn our way into heaven, into eternal life. Being good according to our own standards is not good enough. And I've seen this. People say, oh, I'm good. I live a good life. What do I need God for? Someone who considers themselves good enough, they overestimate their own righteousness. And they underestimate God's holiness. See, God is so holy. There's, there's nothing in God that has any shadow in it. He is so holy and so righteous, there is absolutely no shadow of turning in him. There is no wickedness that even comes close to him. And because of his holiness, we, it doesn't matter how good you think you do, 
You're not good enough to approach the throne of God. The Bible says that he lives in, an, uh, in this glory. And if you saw the Father God's face in his unveiled glory, you'd be dead. That's how powerful he is. That's how holy he is. And this is why Jesus confronts the issue with the young man by asking a question. He says, why do you call me good? He answered. No one is good except God alone. So if you consider yourself to be a good person here today, you overestimate your own righteousness. God sees through everything. He sees the thoughts that come into your mind. The malice, the, the lust, the whatever it is that, that, that you sin in, even if you're outwardly polished and you do good things, you are a sinner. So am I. All people are sinners, and we fall short of the glory of God. Jesus confronts it. He says, why do you call me good? He answered, no one is good except God alone. Now, this young man had come to the conclusion that he was not a, really a sinner, that bad sinner. Maybe. maybe he said, maybe he would concede that he was a sinner. Oh, not that bad of a sinner. I've kept the Ten Commandments through my life. See, like Ferris, the Pharisee Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, one of the ruling Pharisees came to Jesus. This young man, just like Nicodemus, he recognized that Jesus was indeed a righteous man and had the same qualities on the surface level, at least, of him. Nicodemus said to Jesus when he approached him in John chapter 3, 1 to 3, he says, now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So it's clear that Nicodemus came to Jesus with this question. And Jesus gave him an answer. He says, there's no righteous deed you can do, Nicodemus, to earn yourself a place in heaven. And it's clear that this young man that came to Jesus and fell before him thought that he was a good guy. But that Jesus might just add on something that might make his life a little bit better. And this is why Jesus asked him the question, you call me good. In a sense, he was asking this fellow, do you actually understand who you are talking to? Do you recognize that only God is truly good? If I am good, then you, do you recognize that I am God? And then if I am God, then I can see into the deepest depths of your heart? Do you understand what you truly need? It's like Jesus was asking that of him. You see, Jesus, he's no ordinary man who has just good character traits. He's not just a good teacher. No, Jesus is the pure lamb of God, and in him is no darkness. There is no sin nature in him. That's why he was able to give himself as a sacrifice and die instead of sinners like you and like me. From everlasting to everlasting, Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is God. And because he is God, he knows exactly what each one of us needs. God knows. God knows exactly what you need. He knows what's hanging us up and the core issues of our hearts. So here... Here in this passage, he nails this right on the head. Bang! This rich young ruler thought he was good because he obeyed the Ten Commandments, because he lived a good, upright, moral life. But in his heart, his religion was all about making some improvements so that his own life would go better in the here and now and also in the afterlife. Jesus told this man that what he was lacking was a heart that was bent towards serving God and serving others. You see, this young man, it was all about him. Jesus exposes this. 
What he really needed was to lay aside his selfish ambitions and be willing to become a servant, a servant of God and a servant of others. The very same scenario was presented to Jesus on, with, by his own disciple's mother, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. In Matthew 20, 25, um, James and John's mom came to the Lord, and she asked him for a favor. It's, it reads, Jesus called them together and said, oh, sorry, he asked, that she asked uh, Jesus for a favor, and what he wanted was he wanted James and John to be on Jesus' right hand and his left hand when they entered the kingdom of heaven. He, she wanted special positions for her boys. Oh, moms, you always want to see your kids excel, right? And if your kids are walking with the Messiah, you want to see them do well and, and, and be with him and, and, and be rewarded. Moms do that, right? You want to see your kids do well. But you see, in the kingdom of God, there's a difference than the, the way we approach uh, things in this world where we want to see success. See, in response to the mother of James and John, Jesus, this other disciples were like, oh, they were indignant about that. How could you guys, you know, try and be, pull a sneaky one and try and be number one and two, you know? How could you? So Jesus is like, okay, you guys are missing something here. He called to them, Matthew 20, 25. Jesus called to them. He called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the world's leadership model is not the model of leadership that God calls his children to. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you want to be a leader in the kingdom of God, you're not advancing yourself. You're laying yourself down for the good of others. A truly great leader in the kingdom of God is one who serves God. And in serving God, he has the heart of God and he serves others because Jesus came to serve us. He didn't have to, but he did. Jesus knew that this rich young ruler was comfortable. He liked his money. He liked his position of authority. And he wanted to live for himself without any entanglements or complications. His religion was an add-on. Giving away his wealth? Are you kidding? That's not in the plan. Giving away uh, his life? And actually following the, the, in the footsteps of Jesus? That wasn't his plans either. He wanted Jesus to give him this package so that he could just add it on to his own life for himself. Man, this is the heart of the sin nature. This is the heart of all of us if we if we follow our nature given to us by Adam and Eve. Yet Jesus loved this man, it says he did, and he had compassion on him because his life was so empty. This man had climbed the ladder of success, obviously only to find his ladder leaning against the wrong building, you might say. Um, and sadly, his, his seeking after eternal life was like seeking the Holy Grail. He was looking for eternal life as he was looking for an elixir, as an add-on, and ultimately coming to God was not about serving God. It was all about trying to see how God could add on to him, how God could serve him, how God could make him more comfortable in this life, how God could give him fire insurance and further comfort in the life to come. It was all about him, me, myself, and I. And you hear the serpent's hiss in the Garden of Eden. Don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to be like him? Oh, yes, you do. 
You want the power. You want the control. Jesus knew his heart and exposed it. And it took the man off guard. He wasn't expecting the response that Jesus gave him because he didn't really believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. He only regarded Jesus as a good moral teacher, just like he regarded himself as a relatively good man. And we read the man's response starting with verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This man loved his life and his comfort and his pleasures more than he loved God. And Jesus loved him enough to expose the lie that he was living in and give him an opportunity to gain eternity and to follow him. And sometimes good and moral people think that they have no need for God to them. Like, it's like building their own dream home. They think of their salvation as being something that they have to earn through their own self-efforts, by being better, by pursuing this, by pursuing that, by pursuing the other thing. Jesus offered this man. What did he offer him? His friendship and his guidance. If he only understood, if he only understood who he was really walking away from, he would have obeyed. He wouldn't have just fallen to his knees and, and, and said, good teacher. He would have said, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to thee. Matthew spoke the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 13 about the heart and how there are four different types of hearts. When we talk heart, we're talking spirit. Four different kinds of hearts a person could have comparing this, the heart of humanity as being like four different kinds of garden soils, you might say. And one kind of heart, when you look at Matthew 13, there is a heart that is soft and it readily receives God's word, but there is a problem even though there is some reception of God's word and there is some softness towards it. The heart is contaminated with thorns. And Jesus speaks of this heart as, as being one who is deceived by putting their hope in the wealth and the pleasures of this world. In Matthew 13, 22, he writes, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. This rich young ruler, ultimately, his heart was filled with thorns. He was more ultimately interested in his earthly treasures than he was in God's heavenly treasures. And as such, essentially, at the root of it all, he was an idolater. An idolater. You see, in his own mind, he kept the Ten Commandments. He didn't realize he was breaking the very first one. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Sadly, worldly wealth was first in his life instead of the true God of the Bible. And he put his money first. So, Jesus is teaching this and the disciples are looking and they're going, whoa. They're amazed. Verse 24 of our text, reading from there. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Whew. Heavy. You know, you look at uh, documentaries and you see this camel trudging along through the deserts of Israel. Can you thread that animal, a great big animal through a needle? No way. Impossible. Spiritually speaking, the pursuit of love and wealth is very big, right? It's a big draw on people. Actually, it's one of the single biggest things 
I said this earlier, that keeps people out of the kingdom of God. Because pursuing wealth and comfort essentially leads people to try and control the outcomes of their life for themselves. We're setting up money as a God because money gives us a sense of power and control over our future and our destiny. If we have control, then subconsciously we tell ourselves that we don't need God in our lives. We can navigate it ourselves. Maybe, you know, when I'm old and gray and and I'm in my last year of life, maybe then I will uh, reevaluate things. But for now, I want to be the master of my own destiny. I want to call the shots, and money gives me the ability to pursue what I want. Wow. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Good question. If it's easier for a camel to go through the, be threaded through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, they were looking at each other, well, who's going to get saved then? Who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said this. He said, Without, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. I think the disciples, I, I think they were actually amazed because deep down inside, they could identify in some part with this rich young ruler. And all of them being human, they, they desire security, comfort, and, and to experience nice things in life. We all do. We thank God for the freedom in our country to pursue things, right? We thank God for his provisions. We thank God for his blessings. And we like it. But what Jesus said is the cornerstone of the entire gospel message. And this morning, we cannot miss this lesson. Inheriting eternal life is not something you can earn. You're not going to earn eternal life by being good enough. You're not going to earn eternal life by coming to church once a month or four times a month or six times a month or once a year, whatever it is. You're not going to earn eternal life by being a good person. You're not good enough. You can't be good enough. You underestimate your own righteousness and underestimate God's holiness. If we think we're good on our own, we're lying to ourselves. We're not. We're sinners that have been saved by grace if we have accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. This is not something that we've earned. It is by God's mercy that we're given eternal life. See, the rich young ruler, you notice when he came up to Jesus and bowed before him, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said only one thing you need to do here. You need to give up control over your life. And you need to follow me. That's what it was. He, this young ruler, had to be willing to give up what was most precious to him in his life. Because that was his idol. That was where his heart was. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, you see? This ruler, his heart, was about his comfort and about all about him. And following Jesus, what is that going to mean? Could be tough sometimes. I mean, the Son of Man, when he was going through the, through the areas, he had no place to lay his head. It's not like they were staying at the, uh, you know, the re Regent Hotel in Jerusalem and had servants waiting on them hand and foot. He was out there ministering to the poor, laying his life down. In John 6, 28 and to 37, Jesus was dealing with the same issue as what we're speaking about in our text this morning. 
John 6, 28 to 37, just as an illustration of what we're doing here, what we're saying here. And then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered them, answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will no means cast out. Isn't that beautiful? You see how that ties in with our text here? There are riches in Jesus, in the person of Jesus, that this world knows nothing of. The inheritance of eternal life that Jesus offers is a gift of grace given freely by God. It's not something we earn. It's not derived by doing anything good except to surrender the controls of our life over to him. To truly believe and to follow him. See, Jesus was rich in, in that he was our creator. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth and everything in it belongs to him. Everything that you are and everything that you have belongs to him. He's the creator. King David said, the earth is the Lord, in Psalm 24.1, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Yet our creator, Jesus, the living word of God, as the book of John tells us, became poor for us so that we could become rich in him. Paul further clarified this truth in his second letter to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. So, although salvation was impossible to attain merely by human efforts, just as much as it's humanly impossible to force a great big camel through a, a needle's eye, eternal life is only possible through the work of God because God, by His grace, has given us provisional life through His Son, Jesus, the author of and perfecter of our faith, the bread that comes down to us from heaven. And we see this wonderful truth in our text where we continue in verse 28, then Peter spoke up. We've left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions 
and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. You look at that and you go, hmm, that's a bit of a mind scramble. What is, what is the Lord saying here? See, in this, Jesus was assuring his disciples that no one who follows him will ever lose what is genuinely important, either in this life or the life to come in eternity. And this means that he's going to meet our needs. And sometimes what we need is not what we think we need. Sometimes we need to have our perspective shifted so that we view things from God's view rather than the world's view. You know, I've known people who have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, and because they have, their family rejects them. They're outcasts. They don't want nothing to do with them. And yet that same person finds meaning and, and fellowship in the church with other believers who have the same heart after God as they do. You see, you can't, you can't outgive God. He's going to take care of you. And we don't do what we do to get stuff. We do what we do because God changes our hearts and he fills our hearts with love for him and our hearts are filled with love for him and what, what, what beats inside of our chest is a heart of God that beats for others because Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to you and me when we were in our deepest needs and he gave of himself. He was the king and he humbled himself and become obedient to death, even death on the cross. For you because of his great love for you and he wants that heart to be your heart for your vision to be his vision it's not about me and my little kingdom here in the world our kingdom belongs to God and it's eternal it's eternal and it's far more important than the comforts and the little things that we pursue for ourselves and the earth and if you pursue a life after God he'll meet all of your needs doesn't promise that it's going to be easy it says here persecutions are going to follow. You, you might get persecuted, but he says, don't be afraid. I will be with you even to the very end of the age. I will never leave you, my children. I will never forsake you. I will always be with you, and you can depend upon me even though the world falls down around you, and things fall apart, and people betray you, and people hurt you, and people abandon you. You don't have to be afraid because God walks with you in the darkness. Even though the, that you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you need not fear no evil, for the Lord is with you. He is your shepherd and he is good. And you can depend upon him. He is trustworthy and he will never fail. R.J. Letourneau, who made a fortune in business as an industrial equipment manufacturer. Maybe you've seen some of his equipment that he invented in sawmills where they have those great big machines that lift a whole logging truck load of logs off the truck. This inventor, who's a believer, he talks about business. He says, if you give because it pays, it won't pay. If you sacrifice only to get reward for yourself, that reward will never come. God will reward each person who follows him, but we must be sure that our motives are in the right place, and our motives have to be this, that God would be glorified, that God would be served, that God would be worshipped in this world, and that God's gospel would go forth in power in our communities, in our land, in the world, that we would support that with all that is within us, and that would be our mission, because that's God's mission. Everything else is subject to the failure of moth and rust, Moth and rust will destroy. Thieves will break in and steal. You can get the best vehicle in the world, the best house in the world, the best pension plan in the whole world, and all of it means nothing in eternity. All of it means nothing. The only thing that means anything in this life is the work that God has called you to out of love for him. And when you pour your heart out to the Lord, he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. He will empower you to be his disciples and you will be the salt and you will be the light, a city on the hill that will not be hidden. And that's what this world needs. It doesn't need us to pr pr promote this idea that the kingdom of this world is where it's at. It's not. The richest people in this world are some of the most miserable we see this. 
The most powerful, the most prestigious people in this world are often the most miserable. Why? Because I can't get no satisfaction. Yeah, it's a banner song for this generation past. I can't get no satisfaction. Why can't you get any satisfaction? Because you were made for God. God was made for you. And unless you have the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of your heart, nothing in this world will satisfy you. It all ends up in the grave. And then you face eternity and the judgment to follow. And not one of you are good enough to earn your way into the kingdom of heaven. It is only by grace and grace alone that you are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. So today, if you've been putting your, your trust in your wealth, you've been putting trust in your youth, you've been putting trust in your accomplishments, all of those things will fade away, but one thing will never fade away. My word will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away, and that includes the living word of God who is forever and ever king. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he's calling you to his table to be with him, to follow him, there's no difference here today, my friends, than there is, there was in the first century when Jesus called, called his 12 disciples to leave what they had and to follow him. There's no difference. You leave what you have to follow the, the Lord Jesus Christ and you will find life. If you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give your life for his sake, for his name's sake, there you will find life. To wrap it up, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 6, 6, 19 to 20, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The reason why the North American church has been so ineffective is because people... Christians have become lukewarm. They, they think they're rich, but they don't realize how poverty-stricken they really are because their heart's in the wrong place. It's all about building things for themselves instead of building things for the kingdom of God. Don't settle for that. Like, you know, maybe you've given your heart to the Lord and you've served him, but God has so much more he wants you to follow him, not, not just make a commitment to him and sort of fade off in the background. He wants you to be engaged. Ask God, what, what would you have me give to you, Lord? <laughs> not because I'm trying to earn fire insurance. I can't earn it. But because I love you and I want to have your heart. You know, there's a there's a, an artist that stands far and above the rest. Back in the 70s and 80s, he used to sing. And um, you could probably heard of him, Keith Green. I make my life a prayer to you. I only want to do what you want me to. Thank you, Lord, for being patient with me. It's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. I guess I have to trust and believe what you say. You're coming again, Lord. Make my life a prayer to you. Would you bow with me?